Good to see you. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Welcome. Um, I uh, have been here for um, one year this week, and I've been thinking about it because um, that's really kind. Thank you. That's really kind. Thank you. I've been thinking about it because I just love this church so much. And like, I don't know exactly how to say this, but like this, this church is healing something in me. And I am so happy to be here. I like pinch myself in the car on the way home to see if I'm dreaming. I, I just love this place so much. I'm so happy to be here and to talk to you about prayer. We're doing a series called um, God Answers Prayers. It started with this idea of what if you prayed about it the whole year? I'm sure some of you guys are like, it's more like what if the pastor talked about this the whole year? Um, <laughs> I love this George Herbert poem. It's a bit obtuse, but maybe you can catch on to this idea in it. George Herbert said, O oh, unacknowledged, rich and living stream, dark river in each vein and artery, you pulse within us even as we dream, our lifeblood, our salvation's mystery. We all ignore you till we bruise and bleed and you bloom red and reach the upper air. And then we know and see you in our need and every heartbeat is our body's prayer as every pulse of prayer is our soul's blood. Some coursing through us all unconsciously, some owned and known and spoken out for good, all given and returned, all flowing free. From heaven to earth and back to heaven, where the heart of Jesus beats in every prayer. I've never met anyone who regrets any of the time that they spent in their life in prayer. And this is a teaching tool that many people have used. Maybe you heard it or saw it in kids' church or when you grew up. Did anybody learn this way to pray? When they were a kid, I was taught this when I was a kid, and I think it's really helpful. It's just different types of prayer. Supplication really has been the focus of this entire series. We've talked a lot about gratitude and thanksgiving prayer, and thanking God for things. And we haven't talked a lot about confession, but we probably should, because uh, you're all a bunch of sinners. Um, and, uh, we're gonna talk about adoration today. Um, adoring God, the idea of praising God in prayer, which is very natural um, and very true to how we were designed. I wrote this down, praying praise to God gives each breath its best destination. And we were designed to praise God and culture teaches us to praise ourselves and that is such a diminishing amount of happiness and joy that comes from praising yourself and seeking praise for yourself and seeking likes and follows for yourself. It all diminishes, but praising God is an ever-growing and ever-strengthening of your soul in the way that you were designed. You know, we have natural reactions to things. When we see a sunset, we're like, wow, you know? Wow. Or when we see or taste a really good food, we're like, mmm, you know what I mean? Like we have this natural reaction. Praise is the natural reaction to recognizing and understanding who God actually, truly is. It's the furthest thing from, oh, I have to obey, and the closest thing to, I have to do this because it's so true and right. I was reading this week about people who are blind and people who are blind make the same facial expressions as people who can see as children. And so what they've pieced together from that is that we don't smile and frown because we saw our mom do it or because we saw someone at school do it. We do it because there is something innately in us that wants to do that. In fact, they've observed blind people at sporting events, and when they hear that their team scored, they, are, they are, are shown, people have watched and observed them stand up from their seat and lift up their hands. That's not something that they learned from watching other sports fans do it. They can't see that. It's something in them. 
And praising God is something that is hardwired into you. God designed you to praise him. God designed you to see the world. When I look at the heavens, when I look at everything, there's all these Bible verses about it. And we're gonna look at that today. Go ahead and grab your Bible and open to Psalm chapter eight. Grab your Bible and open to Psalm chapter eight. And as you're doing that, let me give you this other idea here, which is when we view praise as exclusively musical worship and not additionally our asset in prayer, perhaps we're missing something. Perhaps praise is the purest form of prayer. And this is the difficulty of teaching an idea like praise in church, because when we talk about praise, everybody thinks of what? Music, they think of musical worship, you know? And uh, that is part of it, that is part of it. But there's also this whole other part which doesn't need to have any music, but it can. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Uh, grab your Bible, open it to Psalm chapter eight. If you're there and you're ready, say, I'm there. I'm there. And I'm ready. I'm ready. Very cool, very cool. So the choir master is this inscription according to the Giddith. The Giddith is a Philistine guitar. It's a type of stringed instrument. I really miss when people used to use the word Philistine as an insult. I think that that was great. And I think that we should bring that back, you know? When someone does something you don't like, you say, wow, look at this Philistine. For example, you might be on a plane and you might have the plane land successfully and someone might start clapping. You could say, look at this Philistine. <laughs> or you might be in your car listening to a podcast and come up to a stoplight. You might see someone running in place at a stoplight, which is one of the worst things you can do in the whole world. <laughs> you could say, look at this Philistine. You might be out on a date. You might see a couple sitting on the same side of the booth. You might say, look at, the, look at these Philistines. You know what I mean? And then we could flip it. When someone does something good, we could call them a Philippian, right? That'd be pretty good. Um, oh, Lord, our Lord, David says, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Majestic in Hebrew is an honor word. Your name is honored. We love the name of God. We love the name of Jesus. We seek to and do honor that name. You've set your glory above the heavens. That could also be translated, your glory is chanted in the heavens. One theologian said, your glory is chanted above the earth, but it is echoed by infants because of what he says in verse two. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger, which kind of initially strikes us as weird because we wouldn't typically perceive that a baby or a child has any capacity to really understand how amazing God is because they have not learned it yet. But interestingly enough, not only is this verse uh, true, this verse is prophetic. It was quoted by Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 21 when he came into the city of Jerusalem, remember this, and everybody had the palm branches and stuff and they were like freaking out and they were like, hey, we're gonna kill you in like five days, but right now we're happy. Do you know what I mean? And in that moment, there were all these kids that were waving these palm branches and they were saying, Hosanna. Hosanna means God save us, God save me. And Jesus quoted Psalm chapter eight about these children who recognized their need to praise God. I was reading this story about an Italian monk this week and he was trying to teach children how to pray, which could possibly be the best use of time that I have ever heard. And he was trying to figure this out. Like, how do I teach kids how to pray? And he was baking bread because monks are incredible. They like know how to do everything, right? Like, if you, if you, did you guys know that monks brew their own beer? Like, you should have one. They're so good. Like, they, those guys know what they're doing. One uh, monk got his beer blessed by the Pope, which is like, that's goals. That's goals right there, right? Um, it also makes you wonder, like, what is the Pope like after a couple? You know what I mean? <laughs> what happens there? So anyways, he's baking bread, and he's trying to think, you know, how can I teach kids how to pray? 
And so he's thinking about various things and, 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 and aspects of prayer, and he's thinking about the shape of your upper body when you are in like the classic prayer pose, right? Which is like this, or like this, you know, or like this, just like very common ways that people would, would pray. They would fold their hands and stand up straight or sit up straight. And he was making this bread and he had this idea and he folded the bread to be in the shape of the upper body. And that was actually, according to two historians, the first time that anybody had ever made bread in the shape of a pretzel. And so he was like, I'm gonna give them these like treats and then when they eat them, I'm gonna talk to them about the folded, like the folded bread, like the folded hands. And he called them pretola, which means little rewards, which I love. It's so true, it's so true. And you can hear how pretola came to be like, like the word that we have, you know, which is, which is pretzel. He understood something that I don't know if everybody understands, which is that praising God is not a means to an end. It is an end. Praising God is not a means to an end. It is an end. And as he continued to hand out these pretzels and teach these kids that it is a little reward. Prayer, turn to somebody next to you and say, little reward. Little, prayer is a little reward. And then they continued to do this and, and the Catholic Church in um, Europe started to um, use these pretzels during Lent because they were made with such simplistic ingredients that they weren't uh, breaking their special type of fast that they were doing during the season of Lent. In fact, they started hiding pretzels around their homes on Easter Sunday, so kids would wake up and they would go look for these little rewards, these little rewards that were symbolic of the little rewards that you get from prayer, which I like because I am very anti-Easter bunny, because I think the Easter bunny is weird. <laughs> he is weird, don't you? Why is this bunny so large? <laughs> He's really big. Why are all of his eggs technicolored? Is the implication that he's laying eggs full of candy? If so, shouldn't we clean them first? How, why is he hiding all of them? Doesn't he just want the kids to have the candy? What's really going on here? Do you know what I mean? Which makes me think that at mission, instead of having an Easter bunny on uh, Easter, we should have a person dressed up as a pretzel. Because that, that makes some theological sense right there. Now that is something that you would want the kids to learn and understand. It's a little reward. I got more though. Oh, these. It is this, 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 does anybody want a pair? Come on up. We're flush, bro. Crank out those prayer glasses. That's my guy right there. You want the knuckles too? You want two? Of course. Here you go. There you go, boom. Two, there you go. All right, we got three more. Look at this guy, what's your name? Liam. Liam, nice to meet you. Enjoy your glasses. Okay, that's it. Sorry, bro. Oh, he gave it to him, wow. You love to see it. You love to see it. When you, um, when you choose to understand that prayer is a reward, that prayer is, it is what he was saying in the Middle Ages. And we see that as we continue through the text. He says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set into place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? He's bringing out this idea 
that when you see yourself clearly, you recognize how big God is and how small you are. That is the place where you truly understand how incredible the good news of Jesus Christ is. I mean, think about it, right? Like, if you think that you're amazing, of course it would make sense that God would wanna save you, that God would wanna choose you, that God would wanna pick you. But if you understand accurately yourself, how small you are and, and, and how insignificant I am, how insignificant we all are, and how God chooses to love us anyway. When you see, as one uh, poet said, God's divinity and your depravity, and then you see that gap bridged by the cross of Jesus Christ, you're really seeing how good of news it actually is. When you see and recognize truly how undeserving you are and how much the world lies to you constantly, and tells you to believe in yourself and think that you're amazing. Don't believe in yourself. Don't do that, that's a mistake. Don't follow your heart unless your heart follows Jesus. And when you see your own self truly, like he's saying, like, who am I? And then you see the, glory, the majestic glory of God and the fact that the cross of Jesus Christ bridges those things then you are seeing clearly how beautiful and valuable the good news of Jesus Christ actually is. I wrote this down. When I celebrate the greatness of God, it shrinks me accurately. I am gloriously reduced to my true size. Now this is the opposite of what you're being taught everywhere in the world. This is the exact opposite of that. Everything in the world is you're amazing, you're awesome, perform and have everyone figure out how incredible you are. And that's not the truth. Not only is it not the truth, it's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. And that's a little reward. Yet you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor He's like, not only are we insignificant, but God has given us these brilliant and beautiful jobs to do. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. God gives us these glorious tasks to do around the world, is what he's saying. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. He's giving us this idea, which is that we are not God, but we get to praise God. And recognizing that and living that is a little reward. It truly is a little reward. I also wrote this down. We are here to lead the orchestra of praise of all creation and creatures. He's painting this picture of the entire earth and how God has given us all of these tasks and roles. And it is such a little reward to recognize what a blessing and privilege it is to praise God. I went to Christian school when I was a kid where the Bible was a textbook and where opening up a hymnal was a, was a daily activity. And it, it, didn't, it, wasn't, it didn't feel like it's supposed to feel because when you're doing something out of obligation, it's not the way that you were designed to do it. We were designed to uh, see and understand how truly glorious and incredible God is and then have no option but to continually praise him. When you truly see God for who he is and for who you are and for what he's done and for what he has given to you, the only natural reaction is to praise him. And he closes with the same thing that he started with. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's a Hebrew poetic device. It's called an inclusio. It's where they would start and finish with the same idea to communicate its conclusion. It's like how there's like limericks in Ireland and haikus in Japan. It's a, it's a stylistic flourish. It's not difficult to continue having the same type of relationship with someone. It's difficult to change it, especially if that change involves intense language. 
So we know that we're supposed to praise God and we recognize that praising God is correct, but for some of us, most of our relationship with God is asking God for things or telling God that we need things or telling God that we've made the same mistake again and asking for forgiveness, which is great. All of those things are great. Or telling God that we need him because we've been found out doing something or, or something like that. And so this idea of shifting to a relationship wherein we feel comfortable and do exercise this act of praising God directly between us can feel awkward for some of us because it's a massive relational change. Like if you have somebody at work that you only ever complain to about your boss, then it would feel very unnatural tomorrow to go into work and start just talking positively about the boss. Does that make sense? Like you've established that your relationship is, is one of complaining and perhaps accurately, but it would be weird to and difficult to change it. I'm gonna come back to this idea. Um, uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch said in uh, the year, uh, in, in the um, century that Jesus was here, and you have all been formed into one choir to sing God's song together and praise the Father with one voice through Jesus Christ. That when he hears you, he may realize from what you've done so well that you are of his son's members. That prayer is a little reward. Irenaeus said in the 100s, infinitely merciful as you are, it's your will that we should learn to know you. That's a little reward. Origen said in the 200s, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will shelter us as we rest our peace of mind and body once recovered. Glory to God the eternal, age after age, amen. That was a little reward. St. Basil the Great said in the 300s, as I rise from sleep, I thank you, O Holy Trinity, for through your great goodness and patience, you weren't angered with me, an idler and a sinner. That's a little reward. The whole earth is a living icon of the face of God, said John of Damascus in the 700s. That was a little reward too. Athanasius, the Athenite, said in the 1000s, glory to you, God, Lord, Jesus Christ, help me. Which is one of the most stunning prayers in, in history because that prayer was recorded as he was praying in his church and a stone from the structure of the church fell on him and ultimately killed him. Those were his last recorded words. One more little reward. John Calvin in the 1500s said, my God, my father and preserver, who of your goodness has watched over me during the past night and brought me to this day? Grant also that I may spend it wholly in the worship and service of your most holy deity. That was a little reward. Philip Neri said, the cross is the gift God gives to his friends. That was a little reward. Charles Spurgeon said, we have a God who stands like a host at a festival, which is all provided and prepared. And that too was a little reward. When you choose to praise God in prayer, you are joining a parade of saints from all of recorded history. This is the action of people who know God the psalmist said, taste and see that God is good. To know him is to love him. To love him is a desire to praise him. And everyone who truly knows God truly desires to praise him. And when we choose to cultivate that, we find out that it multiplies within us. Our desire to praise God continually multiplies as we continue to exercise it. There's lots of ways to praise God in prayer. We can use adoration words like who God is. And I would encourage you to ask yourself a question like what is something that I have seen God do and then answer that question in praise. I had a hard time learning how to do this because I, pr I prayed so many prayers uh, in, in Christian school as a kid that you would just read out loud. And so you didn't always have to mean them. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes they're just things that you were saying or you'd sing a song about how God is loving, but you didn't connect it to what you actually truly think. 
And it's really a beautiful thing to observe things about God that you have seen and then praise him for those things. Like, God, you've been gracious to me. Grace means getting something that you didn't deserve. Or God, you've been merciful to me. Mercy means not getting something that you do deserve. Or God, you're good. Or take it into the field of remembrance. God, when I was in college and I woke up that Saturday with a hangover and a headache, nobody would even return my calls because of my behavior, but you saw me and you loved me at my worst. That is a little reward. Or make a trust proclamation, which is choosing to believe something that you don't feel, but something that is said in, in scripture says, like, I feel really discouraged, but I'm going to choose to praise God anyway, because God, you said that those who hope in you will run, but they won't get tired. They will walk and they won't grow faint. That is a trust proclamation. And that is a little reward. Or if you're feeling depressed, you can say, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Isaiah 26, three, that is a little reward. That's a trust proclamation. Or you can say, if you're feeling down about yourself, you can say, I, no, 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 because I read in Genesis chapter one that I have been made in the image of God. I look a little bit like my parents, but I truly look like God. That's a, that's a trust proclamation, and that is a little reward. Or you can say, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. God has given me a spirit of power and love and a soundness of mind. And I don't have to feel that to proclaim that I trust in what he is saying. And that is a little reward. Or if you have a doubt about something, or if you feel frustrated about yourself, or if you have a suicidal thought, you can choose to make a trust proclamation to God. You can say what it says in Psalm 118, I will not die, but I will live and I will recount the deeds of the Lord. That is a trust proclamation and it is a little reward. Or simplicity. I love what the psalmist says. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. I love praying this phrase. We bless the name of Jesus in this place because everything about the world teaches you that your life is about getting blessings on yourself. And God designed you the opposite way of that. God designed you to bless God and God designed you to experience little rewards when you do what you were created to do. And all of the time that you spend trying to amass blessings on yourself for your beauty or your performance or your power or whatever, all of that is a waste and it brings about diminishing levels of happiness. But when you choose to spend yourself in the praising of God, you will find that it multiplies in your soul silence together. We talked about that last week. You know, it's a very common idea that you spill what you are full of. Have you heard this idea before? It's like, like whatever's going on inside of you, if you get bumped, that's kind of like what comes out. Do you know what I mean? It really helps to have grace with people who react erratically to things because you're like, wow, that was in that person. Do you know what I mean? And we've all had moments where we have things inside of us that we are like, ugh, you know? And you, you, see, you see this everywhere. Like, um, for example, like if you, if you get fired from a job and you choose to then go and like push the copier down the stairs, then <laughs> your boss will say something to the effect of like, oh, wow, like that was, we made a good decision. <laughs> Therein lies the reason why we fired you. You have spilled what you are full of. Or like if you break up with someone and they start sending you all these crazy texts and they start taking your email address and signing you up for every politician's email list, <laughs> you will say, that was the reason why we broke up. It's perfect. It is such a great illustration of why I don't wanna spend the rest of my life with you or the rest of this minute with you. And 
we really do spill what we are full of. And I have found that that is not true in prayer. I have found that you do not pray what you are full of. I have found that you are full of what you pray. And I have found that the more that you praise God, the more that your heart desires to do so, and the more that you exercise yourself in looking for little rewards, the more that you find them in little moments of prayer. Fill your heart with praise, not of yourself, but of your God. This is the way of Christ. And I got a little, little bonus for you, which is that praise also chases away discouragement. And if you're here today and you've come here today in discouragement, don't do what your body and brain want to do. Don't think of all the reasons people don't like you. Don't ignore people's texts and calls and go lay under the covers and watch another three hours of Netflix. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Choose to praise God, which chases away discouragement. It's the opposite of what you want to do, but it's the best thing for you, and it's what you were designed to do. I read, I read this story on Reddit this week that was so funny, and it is, it's actually where this idea came from, because there was this kid in Europe somewhere, and he was walking around with his iPhone and the headphones on, in some like really cold place. He was like in the woods or forest somewhere. And he got surrounded by several wolves. And he was like freaking out. And he was like, what am I gonna do? <laughs> and so he, he un, you can look this up. This is a real story. And he unplugged his headphones and he was like, I'm gonna turn on the most annoying song I can. And he turned on a song by the band Creed <laughs> on full volume. And the, the wolves ran away and he was saved, which is the best story for a variety of reasons. One of which is I just love to hate listen to Creed's greatest hits. And number two, it's very funny. And number three, it perfectly illustrates this idea of some sort of sound chasing away something that is evil and praising God chases away discouragement. And... Uh, isn't that, isn't, isn't that a little reward? Isn't, 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 isn't being able to praise God in a moment of discouragement and watching discouragement flee such a little reward that we don't deserve? We've saved some time in the service today to do a special guided prayer and so that's gonna be coming up on the screen in a moment. We also um, have another exercise that we're gonna do. There's gonna be a phone number that's gonna go up on the screen and you can text things that you want to praise God about. And we're gonna put some of them up on the screen that you text in now during the meditation so that we can see some of the praises of God from people in the room. So all of that's gonna be up there on the screen and I hope that you will lean in if this type of exercise or something is uncomfortable for you as it is for many Christians, this is a great thing to do and I believe it will really bless you. And so I, um, yeah, I hope that you will lean in and get this, get this little reward um, with the rest of us this morning. Mm -hmm. 